Hey there, this is Pastor Don. I'm so excited you've decided today to watch with us from our Church on the Move experience in Glenpool, Oklahoma. And it is awesome. Can't wait for you to see it. Jump in. There comes a point in every Sooner fan's life (laughs) when you begin to ask yourself, am I on the wrong road? Have I met the real Jesus? And then the Lord shows up and performs mighty miracles, things to propel his church forward. Not just this church, the capital C church. What happened yesterday was good for all of humanity. And uh, if you're unaware of that, then I can't help you. Um, No, I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm a little bit more excited than maybe I would have been yesterday. After about 18 hours of watching that game, I thought... If this doesn't end well, then, 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 then we're going to run the video from the other churches because I don't have anything to say. <laughs> good morning. It is so good to be here. If you don't know me, my name is Gabriel. I'm the pastor here. And um, man, I'm excited to be talking about the home. Uh, this is the second week of our series, Hope for the Home. And, and when I say the home, I'm not just talking about uh, a marriage with children. I'm talking about uh, individuals. We're all, we're all, you know, byproducts of our home environment. Whether we are married, whether we are single, whether we have children, whether we don't, empty nesters, just getting started. It really doesn't matter whether you're old or young. We are affected by uh, home, and we are affected by the home we came from. We're affected by the home, whether it was a good home, whether it was a broken home. We are all uh, moving forward and profoundly shaped by where we originate. And I want to talk for a little bit today about the past. I want to talk about our past, which is a little bit different. We don't do that too terribly often in church, but trust me, this is going to be, it's going to be good. It's going to be good, and I'd say more than good, it's incredibly necessary. And I would also say that I don't think it's something that we address enough, but this isn't to look backwards to be discouraged. This is to look backwards to be encouraged about where God is leading us, what he's been doing, what he's already done, what he will do. And uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm going to pray here in just a second before I do. I want to let you know next week, uh, you want to be here. You want to be here. My dad's going to be here, our founding pastor, Willie George, and he's all right at preaching, and he has some good things to say, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones, you know, it's fine, but he, uh, no, he's going to be out here, and uh, every time he's here, it's a great gift. I'm so thankful for the family I come from. It's not a perfect family, but I've thought about this a lot of times in my life, and I've said this to God a lot of times in my life. I could have been born anywhere, at any time, any place in history, to any people. Uh, and I'm thankful for my family, and I'm thankful uh, for the heritage I have, and I'm thankful for what I've learned uh, from my parents, from my dad, as he's going to be out here preaching. It will affect your life, and you need to be here for it. We're also going to be doing baptisms next week. And uh, I I just want to encourage you to be here because it's a celebration for our church. This is why we're here. This is why we gather to see life change. It's not just to come in and hear something good. It's to see what God is doing. And whenever we see the work of God in other people, oftentimes what it does is reveal something to us. So being here for that and seeing what God is doing, it's always a special thing. It's always an incredibly special thing. It's an emotional thing for me just to see people's obedience, and maybe you're in the room, and you're going to be baptized next week, and I just want to say congratulations to you and how proud we are as a church of you and the step you're taking, and so next week's going to be really special. Uh, Before I get into this message uh, about our past, I would love us to pray, so would you join me in doing that, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We take a minute, and we pause, we settle ourselves, we settle our mind, We settle our heart and we think of you as a father. As we move forward into this next few minutes, Lord, we need your guidance. We need your spirit to move on us, to open our eyes to what we cannot see. Help us to see what you've been doing. Help us to see how you've been active, not to respond in timidity or fear, but to respond with hope, knowing that you are moving 
You're moving in our lives. You have been moving. Sometimes, Father, it feels like we are in isolation. Sometimes we isolate ourselves from you. Sometimes we break our connection with you, or at least it seems like we do. But Lord, you are faithful when we are not. And you hold to us, and you work through us, and you're working in our lives all the time so that we can see who you truly are and how much you love us. Help us to see your love for us. Help us to see the plan you have for our lives. It won't be everything, Lord, but help us to see those steps. We follow you by stepping. You guide our path. Our trust is in you. I ask that you help me to articulate this clearly, but more importantly, Lord, I ask that your spirit speak. As I am so familiar with the process of stepping off the stage and hearing how you have moved in people, and oftentimes it's things that I didn't really even highlight or even in some ways completely say, but your spirit moves. Our being here is an act of faith. My standing here speaking is an act of faith, and you are moved by faith. And so we thank you so much for working on our behalf to move us into relationship with you and it's in Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. Uh, about 16 years ago, maybe a little bit more than 16 years ago, uh, Thanksgiving time, my wife Summer decided to fly back to Southern California to see her family for Thanksgiving and I was going to stay here. I had some work to do and I wasn't gonna go with them and she was gonna be there for a few days. She was with my daughter Jane who was less than two at the time and I sent my wife or took her to the airport and her and my daughter flew off and uh, I was probably at home alone for about four hours until I decided I don't want to do this I don't want to spend Thanksgiving by myself I miss my wife and my daughter and so I got online uh, actually I don't know if I got online I don't even know if online was actually happening back then uh, I got somewhere maybe I called a travel agent and, uh, and I, I booked a plane ticket and flew out to Southern California and surprised my wife. I thought, you know, I miss her and I also would like to be in the warm weather. And so I flew out and, and landed in Palm Springs and uh, surprised my wife there for Thanksgiving. It's the first Thanksgiving, really first holiday I had spent uh, at my in-laws house. And my wife is one of seven kids and uh, she's one of the youngest, and so most of the siblings were older, in some cases quite a bit older, and had families, and there was a lot going on. And, and, and I had heard a little bit about how my in-laws did holidays, but I, I had never really experienced it. And so I get out there, I fly in, I'm excited to be there. Uh, I'm excited to be there for, for, for about an hour. And then um, I realized that this is really different. This is really different than what I'm used to. There was a lot happening a lot of what I would call chaos. Now, it doesn't mean it's chaos, but for me and my family, where I come from and my home, this was chaos. There were people everywhere on Thanksgiving Day. Typically for me, I just wanted to kind of eat a big meal and then you know, lay on a couch comfortably and quietly and watch football, but not, not at my in-laws. Football was going on, but it was the least of the exciting things happening in the house with all the people coming in and out in and out. My, my in-laws embody the phrase, mi casa, su casa. And so what that means is it isn't just family in the house during Thanksgiving. It's anyone. It's anyone and everyone. My mother-in-law is a wonderful woman, and, and this is admirable, but just not really a, a, a core value I have chosen to embrace. But if she sees someone at the grocery store, specifically on Thanksgiving or the day before, and they don't have anywhere to go, she says, come to my house. Come to my house. This is not where I grew up. I don't think my mom has ever walked up to a stranger and go, you know what? Why don't you get on in here? Never has happened. My family, very calm, very structured. There have been times in the holidays where we've had extended family to the house, but we have a plan. My family has a plan, so we work that plan. Summer's family, there is no plan. It's just, it's just love and an open door. And so I'm there at Thanksgiving with my, with my in-laws, 
and, and, and the day, you know, starts off all right, gets a little nuts. By the end of the night, I'm being confronted by one of the brothers for something I didn't stand up for. And I'm like going, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm a guest here. But it didn't matter. I was family. And so they were pulling me right into it and going, you know what? If you're a part of this family, you're all in. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm going back to that bedroom there and you will not see me for the duration of my trip. I hid in the back the whole time. It's very unnerving to me just being a part of a different family culture. My family, not that way. The worst thing that ever happened uh, in, on a, a, during a holiday gathering in my parents' house was, was when my daughter Jane was about one and a half. And m- my brother Witt, his son Francis was about two years old. And we're at my parents' house and we're eating dinner and everything's going okay, but there's always a tension. There was always a tension of we've got to make sure that our kids are, are, are behaving and towing the line. Even at that age, you know, it's like, hey, guys, you know, we're sitting them down. Jane doesn't understand anything. Hey, just want you to know there are some rules at Papa's house, all right? This is how you do it. And she's just like sucking her thumb, looking at me crazy. But I'm going, listen, I need you to get this. If we want to be invited back, I need you to get this. <laughs> and so we're... <laughs> We're at, we're at the house, and we're eating dinner, and we're just kind of in the kitchen talking, and, there I, and then I hear my dad call out from his, the other side of the house, and, and this booming voice, this booming voice, he calls my mom, Deliva! And we know when he calls her like that, and we're all there, we know we should all probably come running. And so we run in, and, and, and Francis, my brother's son, who's two years old about is with Jane. Jane's standing in the office sucking her thumb. Francis has gotten into my dad's wood-burning fireplace, and he's got the little shovel, and he's been scooping ash onto Jane. And she's just standing there covered in ash. And Francis is looking at us just completely bewildered. My dad's standing there in horror, and, and Francis doesn't stop scooping. He just... And ash and dust all through the house. My mom comes in. We grab the, you know, the, the, the shovel from Francis. And we all kind of go into this mode where it's like, you know what? We're going to remain calm, but we know a storm's a-brewing. <laughs> we kind of do everything we can to help clean up, but ash is, is moved through that. It was terrible. My mom's got a lot of stuff on shelves in her house, and it was so filthy, it was dusty. This is the worst thing that's ever happened in our house, and we dare not speak of it. Next week when my dad is here, don't speak of it. (laughs) Don't bring it up, I beg you. It's a long time ago, but the wounds are still fresh. They're there. We come from different places, different cultures. It's amazing how different we are. You realize this when you get married. You realize, you know what, man, my wife, my husband, it, what they grew up in really did a number on them. And you don't realize when you get married, and they tell you this, people who are smarter than you have been married, they tell you this, that you don't just marry you know, the woman, you marry the family. And so it's a good thing that my family lives you know, 1,600 miles away. And, uh, and uh, I don't, I don't I, you know, just culturally, we just try to figure that out. And everything's a little bit different. We're profoundly shaped by our families. And where we come from matters. And, and maybe, maybe more than where we come from, but who we come from. Who we come from deeply shapes us. If you ever find yourself reading through the Old Testament, a lot of people avoid reading through the Old Testament because they, I wouldn't say as much as that they don't understand it, but, but there are a lot of things in the Old Testament that are, are uh, quite crazy quite crazy. I mean, I think it's completely fine to admit that, hey, there's a lot of stuff that's very messed up in the Old Testament. You don't even need to read all of it. Just read Genesis. Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible, probably because it's so unbelievably entertaining, and just the things that are occurring in this book are just mind-numbing. But one of the things that you see in reading through the Old Testament and even through the book of Genesis is you see the plan of God through generations, You see God working through people, and people in these days lived for incredible lengths of time, but what we're doing is we're reading through life stories in a matter of chapters and verses, and we're moving through hundreds of years of history in very short order, and so what we have a bird's eye view of is a plan of God extended over a long period of time. 
God identifies himself often in the Old Testament as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying, I'm the God of generations. He's saying, I'm a God with a plan. He's saying, what you're experiencing in this moment is not everything that I have been at work. I am working. I will be working. And I am moving beyond your current situation and current predicament. This is something that for Westerners, and even especially in this day and age, that it's a little bit tricky for us to get a hold of. We think so much about our place. We don't really identify with ancestry as much, albeit it's something that we sort of engage in, but really, whenever someone asks us where we come from, half of us can't even really say, I'm not really sure, I don't really think about it, I'm not really all that connected to my family story, but God is saying in the Old Testament when he identifies himself, I am the God of generations. Where you come from matters to God. And it doesn't just matter to God. He's been working through where you come from. You are a part of a much, much bigger story than just yourself, just your life, just your dreams. There's a phrase in church circles, conferences that may extend outside of that, and it goes something like this. Your mess becomes your ministry. Your mess becomes your ministry. The idea being that the challenge or the pain, the struggle that you walk through becomes sort of a building block for the work that you end up doing for God. I look at Church on the Move. Church on the Move has been in existence since 1987. My dad started the church. It started in a hotel room. started from nothing turned into what it is today. We have a church here in Glenpool, a church in Broken Arrow, a church in Midtown, and a church in Tulsa. If you've ever been to the main campus, which I'm sure most of you have done, I call it the main campus because that's where the buildings all started. But if you look around, what you see is incredible structure. There's structures everywhere. There's a school. There was a camp we had. All these different things. There's a youth building that is enormous that a lot of people drive up to and think it's something completely different. They think, is that a theater? No, that's, that's, a, that's a youth building. There's all kinds of structure at Church on the Move. And we haven't really ever talked about this, and, and, and it's not really all that important. But I think about this stuff often. I, 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 I look at all of this, and I look at where Church on the Move is, and, and I see it as a byproduct of my dad's mess. God worked through it. My father grew up in a very unstable home. His parents divorced when he was young. His mom was an alcoholic. His dad basically jumped ship. He was alone a lot as a young man, as a teenager, a young teenager. He was sort of left to fend for himself. So I look around today and what do I see? I see God working through a man who experienced tremendous brokenness and instability in his youth, and I see God working through to create structure and stability for so many others. A mess became ministry. God works through where you come from. He works through who you come from, and whether we like it or not, we are tied to where we come from. Years ago, I was a counselor, a camp counselor at Dry Gulch, our summer camp, and uh, we had a lot of different activities there, and one of the activities that we had was this inflatable game, it was called the bungee run, and I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to do this, but you strap yourself in at the back part of the inflatable, and you're in this harness, and there is an elastic, a, a very strong elastic cord connected to you, and the idea is that you would run down that, and that Velcro strip in the middle lane, the partition there, you have something in your hand, you run as far as you can, you stick it on that Velcro strip, and whoever gets, you know, the furthest just wins at life. And so um, we would do this as counselors, and we would have competition as counselors to see who could run the furthest and make it the furthest. This is a good picture of life. It's a good picture of who you're connected to and how that works for a lot of us. See, not everyone has their past or their, 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 their family story redeemed. And I would say that it isn't just a you either have it redeemed or you don't. I would say that the parts of it can be and parts of it aren't. That you're sort of running away from something or running, maybe not away, but you're running to progress. You're, 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 you're looking for a momentum in life and then something snaps you back. 
It could be a behavior. It could be a way of thinking. You ever wonder why you spend money you don't have? You ever wonder why you blow up? You ever wonder why you can't seem to get over the addiction? You ever, you ever wonder you know, why it's so intimidating for you to stand up for yourself and say no? You ever think about these things? Is this just part of your DNA? Has it come from somewhere? Your familial history you're tied to. Now, it's not all that popular, I would say, in some circles of the church to even talk about what has happened prior to. It's not necessary. Jesus heals you, redeems you from your past. That once you find Christ, anything that happened before you is done with and you just march forward. Is that true? I'd say yes and no. Here's why I find it to be very unhealthy for us to just say, you know what, forget it, we're moving forward. We're moving forward. It didn't happen. It's, it's not helpful for us to move forward. One, because we can't be healed from what we are unwilling to face. You can't be healed by just remaining ignorant or choosing to remain ignorant. There's a story in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The children of Israel are in the wilderness. They are between Egypt and the promised land. They are in camp. They begin to do what they did many times. They begin to complain. They complained about God. They complained about Moses. They complained about their situation. And it says in Numbers that venomous snakes came out and begin to bite and kill many of the Israelites. The people who were left, the people who were bitten but not dead, begin to cry out to Moses and to God, God, help us. Moses, do something. We're sorry, do something. God says to Moses, put one of the snakes on a stick, elevate it high in the camp, and any person who goes to look on the snake who stands in front of it and looks at it, will be healed. It's a really interesting story. But what I see in this story is God saying, you have to face what's hurting you. When you stop there and stare at the thing that's killing you, it's only then that you can begin to find healing. If you had a rock in your shoe and you were walking with a limp, and it just began to dig in and create a real problem for you, and we begin to diagnose what was going on and look at it and go, hey, take your shoe off. And you go, I don't want to take my shoe off. There might be something in your shoe. Don't want to do it. Doesn't matter. We're walking. It has nothing to do with walking. If we finally got your shoe off and said, hey, there's a rock in your shoe, and you just said, there isn't a rock. No rock. I'm like, it's right here. No rock. It's not in my shoe. It's not there. It's not affecting me. Faith isn't just trusting that there are no problems in life and that anything that poses itself as a problem is something that we're not to even address. Faith is trusting God in the midst of the struggle. I think it takes way more faith to say, you know what, I come from a place, I've dealt with some things, there are some things that are real, but God. It takes way more faith to do that than to go, no, 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 it's not happening. We can't heal from what we're unwilling to face. And the second reason why we can't just move forward is because nothing you ignore improves. I've tried it. I've tried it with my yard. I've tried it with my body. I've tried, you know, just forget it. It doesn't get better. I have never woken up in the morning and gone, oh my gosh, I have a six pack. It doesn't happen. (laughs) You have to be willing to face and deal with and work through What we do here is we call this growing in freedom. Does God redeem us? Yes. Does God forgive us? Yes. But we are active participants in our healing. Hebrews 12 says this. Paul says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race 
marked out for us. You are redeemed by God Almighty. You need to know that. Some of us have not grasped that reality yet. That the shame of the past or shame of our sin does not have to and should not dictate your future. It is done. You have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. The word says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's done. But healing is a little bit different. Healing is something that we are active participants in. God has a plan for your home. God has a plan for your, for your inner life, the way you work through things, the way you have, a, what you have sort of brought with you. Look, we all have had behaviors and mindsets passed down to us, and not all of them are helpful. Just because we've been somewhere doesn't mean that we have to carry everything with us. And it doesn't mean that where we came from is all bad. I think that's another thing that we deal with. It's very hard to look at your family and go, you know what, that wasn't good. I'll say this specifically for me. It's a challenging thing for me, and has been at least, in my life. To look at things that weren't perfect and say anything about it. And the reason is because there's so much good. And the last thing you want to do is hurt, and so you just go, you know what, no, 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 I, like, I must be misinterpreting it. I don't know, it's, just, it's, probably, it's probably just fine, it's, you know, it's me, and we just try to move forward with the rock and the shoe. But I have found it incredibly helpful in my life to stop every once in a while and take my shoe off and make sure that there's nothing in it. Paul says you have a race to run. God has a race for you. God has a plan for your life, but we are active participants in our healing. That's what we say growing in freedom around here. We believe in growing in freedom, that freedom isn't just something that you get one time. As soon as you pray your prayer of salvation, it's done, and it's, you got it, and you don't have to do anything, and everything that was negative in your life changes, and all of your negative thinking changes. It goes away, and, and from now on, you're a new person. Every And everything you do, the Bible says you have to renew your mind. Why? To grow in freedom. You have to change the way you think. Inwardly, redeemed, forgiven. My heart is pure before God. But we have to overcome. We have to overcome, in many, many cases, where we came from and the patterns that we picked up. So how do we grow in freedom? I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. The first thing is this. You have to identify how your family patterns have shaped you. You have to identify that you are shaped, have been shaped by familial pattern. There's a story in the book of 2 Samuel. David has committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. It's a very well-known story. I'm not going to break it all down, but he sees another man's wife from his roof. He calls her in. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He's trying to cover it up, so he sends her husband out to the battlefield. All the other soldiers around him back up. He dies. David commits murder to cover his sin. And 2 Samuel says this. This is God speaking through Samuel to David. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. God says to David, your sin is going to produce something. Your sin is going to produce and is producing and has produced a pattern in your family. David's children, David's grandchildren were affected by David's sin. The strife, the betrayal, the violence in David's family line is significant. Is it a curse from God? I'd say it's more a curse of sin. I don't see it as God punishing David. I see it as sin producing something. Sin produces something that breaks you. And let me just say this. You are not responsible for the sins of previous generations. You're not responsible. God is not holding you responsible for the sin of your parent, the sin of a grandparent. This is something even in our culture right now and in our country, we're asking this question of who's responsible for the sin of the people who came before us. And there's sort of a narrative developing that if you are connected, you're responsible. I say this, you're not responsible for the sin 
of those who came before you, but you are affected by it. You are affected by it. It's important to identify how familial pattern have shaped you, whether it's negative or positive, it's good to know. So I have some questions I'm going to ask. I'm not going to elaborate on each of them, but I am going to let it sit for just a second. I'd like you, if you want to, you can write these down. We're going to post them on our social media. These are good ways that you can go, you know what, how do I identify familial pattern? How would I know? I have some questions, just a few. First one, how did your family handle conflict? How did your family handle conflict? Second question, how did your family handle feelings? I'm the feeler in my family, the feeler in my family. (laughs) How'd your family handle feelings? I don't know, they thought about it. Okay, how did your family talk about sex? Probably not much. How did your family talk about money? How did your family talk about gender roles? Was, or next question, what was considered success in your family? I know so many people who are driven internally, something they cannot seem to turn off. They cannot stop working. And it is beaten into them somehow, some way. They have this driver that says, you cannot stop. It comes from somewhere. What kinds of addictions, if any, existed in your family. Last question here, were there traumatic losses in the past? Sudden death, prolonged illness, stillbirths, miscarriages, bankruptcy, divorce? You know, I think one of the biggest challenges for us as we hear questions like this, some of them if they produce negative thought or feeling, we resist it. Man, we resist it, why? Because it's uncomfortable. Why would you want to go back to pain, right? A a lot of the time, our response is, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I think there's a little bit more talking going on in the generation that, you know, Gen X, millennial, there's a little bit more talking going on, a little bit more talking required, in large part because the generation that came before us didn't like to talk because the generation that came before them never talked. We don't talk about it. It's weakness to talk about it. We don't do that. That life's that way, not that way. And I would agree, except what is that way and undealt with deeply affects what's that way. We have a soul. We don't talk about the soul all that often. But I preached a message about this sometime during the quarantine. I can't even remember when, but I talked about the soul and Compared the soul to a dryer filter. There is hot air blowing into my dryer, but if my dryer filter is clogged, if there is a lot of lint buildup on that filter, those clothes don't get dry. God is breathing life into you all the time, but if it goes through the filter of your soul and the filter of your soul is clogged up, the life of God doesn't get through the way that it should. The challenge of life, the situations of life, and it isn't just the horrible things in life, but there are so many things in life that begin to block the soul. They begin to to put a film on the soul. And what we have walked through has affected our soul, and it is certainly not weakness to begin to look at the condition of our soul. We are required to. Jesus said, what good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? But a lot of us are walking around with tremendous weight on our soul, and we think that the best way through it is just to keep marching and be stronger. But I would say that doing that isn't really strength at all. There's nothing strong about being unwilling to look at something that's holding you down, that's plaguing you. I would say, in fact, it's more of a weakness. And being tough for the people around you can often hurt the people around you because the people around you see it. 
This is actually meant to be encouraging. (laughs) Hard, but I don't think Jesus said that following him was easy. But it's necessary. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this. We're going to walk through this and unburden our soul. You have to identify the familial pattern. The next thing is this. Once you identify, and this is where it gets good, you begin to fight the battle in the spiritual. Fight the battle in the spiritual. Paul says this in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. He said, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, against authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. The devil, he... It's getting increasingly strange to talk about the devil. Saying the word devil, just talking about Satan, the enemy, a lot of people are like, oh, okay, give me a break. But here's the thing that's fascinating to me is I think it's, it's weird to talk about the devil, but not so weird to talk about a God, a being who exists up there who created all things. It's all weird. It's all weird. It's all a bit odd. We believe in a Jewish messiah who died on a cross 2,000 years ago, was resurrected and paid for our sin. He came from a virgin. It's all weird. It's time for us to embrace the reality that we have an enemy, but not be afraid, but to acknowledge the fact that we have an enemy and begin to fight battles that are spiritual in the spiritual instead of just trying to work through them here with flesh and blood, just trying to talk it through, think it through, and never get to fighting it in the spiritual. We are fighting a spiritual battle, and our spiritual enemy thrives on lying. He lies all the time. And I would say that so much of the baggage we carry around from our past, from our familial story, whatever it is, so much of it is something that happened and occurred. And was there pain? Could there have been pain? Yeah, there could have been pain. But so much of the extended pain is based on the lie that's been told from that moment on. That moment no longer has any power. That moment has nothing to do with you anymore. The pain has been realized and it's there and it's fine to feel pain for what hurts. But the devil wants to take that pain, lie, and then turn it into a mountain. He is constantly lying to us. And if we are unaware of that reality, and if we don't fight on that battlefront, then we will continuously lose. So how do you fight the battle? You fight it with truth. Truth is how you debunk a lie. Do you battle fear? The word says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Are you worried? The Bible says, don't be anxious about everything, but in everything, pray with supplication, thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Do you deal with lust? The Bible says, how shall a young man cleanse his way? How shall a young woman, how shall a human cleanse their way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Lord, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I don't sin against you. Truth. Truth. Truth over the lies. Truth over the narrative that goes on in the head that turns what once was there into something monumental. This is how you get the rock out of your shoe. And the best thing about this is whenever you begin to uncover the lie, you realize all it is is just a rock. It's a little rock in your shoe easily dealt with. You fight the battle in the spiritual. And the last point is this. Do not do it alone. In the book of James, chapter 5, James says this, says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. It's interesting. I've talked about this before, but I always found it interesting that so much of the time I felt like I needed God to forgive me, and God forgave me, but healing wasn't coming. And the book of James says you need to do this with someone. He says healing comes in relationship. And I always thought that was God's job to heal, but God says, no, you're an active participant in your healing. Healing comes in the 
relationship. Healing comes through people. This is how God designed us. We don't like to deal with personal struggle with other people. We don't, we don't like to do it. We like to handle it. And a lot of it is because we kind of grew up just whether it was taught to us or whether it just kind of happens to be where we just feel like, you know what, it's up to us. We have to deal with our own situations. We have to deal with our own challenges. This is no one else's burden. It's mine. I'll figure it out. And a lot of it is we just don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be humiliated. We don't want to be vulnerable. We hate being vulnerable because vulnerability is weakness to us. But I would say there are so many of us walking around with tattered armor thinking that it's keeping us safe, but it's doing nothing for us. And we are not meant to just walk around in tattered armor. We have to exchange it at the cross. But the cross requires a vulnerability. You can't lay at the foot of the cross what you are unwilling to look at. And what do we do with brokenness? We give it to Jesus. We don't hoard it for ourselves trying to piece it back together. I want to read this story here in the book of Mark, and then I'll close. Mark 6. The disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee. The storm is raging, and here comes Jesus, glowing in the night, walking on water. But when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. And they were totally amazed. I think a lot of the time, Jesus is walking up to us with the solution. But we don't see the solution as Jesus. We see the solution as something to be afraid of. Bringing other people into your struggle is scary. It's scary because we're so concerned with how people are going to view us and we have spent so much of our life sort of building up a version of ourselves. It doesn't mean that we're completely broken, but it's amazing what we will guard. We do small groups here at this church, and not every small group is the space where you come in and it's just every week is just completely, you know, it's brokenness and tears. But here's the thing, you know what a small group is for? A small group is so that you can begin to walk and grow and let out a little of what's going on in you. And let me just say this, you don't have to tell everyone your struggles, your secrets, your sin, the pain of your past. You don't have to tell everyone, but you do have to tell someone amazing what happens when you take what lives in secret. I'm not just talking about sin. But when you take what's secret and you bring it into the light. Things fester in the darkness, but in the light, they're healed. I can tell you that the scariest slash best things I've ever done in my life have been taking something that lives in here and saying to somebody, terrifying but immediately liberating. I've heard stories in this church about small group leaders who will say there are people that come into our group and they come in guarded but they're afraid but they find a vulnerability and they share with either them as the leader or the entire group but they're comfortable, whatever it is, and they say this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm dealing with and there is a, there, there, there is a, 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 a vulnerability, there is a sadness, it can be emotional at times for people it's because it's a massive gasp of relief. There is nothing better than saying, oh, I don't have to carry this by myself. And what happens is the church becomes the church, which is we carry each other's burdens. Some of you are walking around with a pack on your back you're not meant to carry alone. And really, you're not meant to carry at all. Your brother or your sister is meant to come beside you and grab that pack off your back and help you go, that doesn't belong to you, throw it at the foot of the cross. But it requires a strength I'll say it again, it requires a strength, not a weakness, a strength. It is a strong man, it is a strong woman who will say, you know what, 
My hope is in the Lord. My value is in the Lord. I am nothing outside of the Lord. Why would it be hard for me to admit where I struggle? Of course I've struggled because I'm flesh and bone, but he is not, so I take my struggle and I put it at his feet. But we are active participants in this kind of healing. And I'm here today to tell you that hope for your home, hope for what's going on in your soul, hope for your future has to do with you and you stepping into it. You've got to begin to walk. I don't know if we're doing small group sign-ups today, but if someone signs someone up for a small group, small group leaders in the room, raise your hands. Here's what we're going to do. You can put your hand down. Seek somebody out. Seek somebody out after the service, but here's what I say. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you to the person you need to talk to. This may be weird. This may be weird. It might seem weird, like, oh, dear God, hurry and get out of the room. Get the kids. All right, you're making a plan. Some of you are making a plan right now. You're looking at your wife going, you know what to do, right? We've talked about this. The code word is bananas. Whenever this happens, you get the kids, and I make it to the car, but, I, but I'm on the phone, too, while I'm walking. I'm talking to no one. I'm talking to no one. There's no one on the phone. I'm going, okay, we'll be right there. You know, you're doing that thing. I get it. I get it. I've done it. I've done it. I'll do it again. But God loves you. He loves you so much. He sees you. You. He's at work through generations, but imagine he sees you. He sees what you carry, and he cares more than you know. So small group leaders in the room, pray a prayer under your breath. Lord, show me. Show me. And if it's not in the room today, then someone's going to text somebody this week. But God is actively pursuing us. Last thing I'll say is this. Years ago, I was sitting on the bed with my two kids. This was five years ago, I think. Summer was out of town, and I was sitting there with Jane and Charlie. And I don't know how we got to talking about this, but I asked them a question. I said, has Dad ever done anything or said anything to you that you are carrying? Is there anything that your heart goes to right now where you feel like it hurts but you're afraid to talk about it or it's just there and you don't even think you need to talk about it and it doesn't make you mad and it doesn't scare me for you to tell me. In fact, it doesn't bother me at all. I want you to tell me. To see, there are times in your life when someone does something to you and someone says something to you and it's like they give you a big old bag of rocks and they hand it to you and you carry it from then on. And even sometimes they do it and they acknowledge that they're wrong, but they're, you're still holding on to it. And I said, Dad wants to know. And my son Charlie looked at me and he said, No. You've been amazing, Dad. No, he said, no. <laughs> My daughter broke down crying. And she said, there was a time when I did, uh, she went through a scenario, she said, there was a time and you said I was being a brat. And she was carrying it. And as parents, what we do is we in our mind, it's not a big deal. We don't even imagine the weight of our words whenever we're just, you know, you're being a brat. It's like, well, you know, you were. I don't know. And she's just heartbroken. And that was years prior. Years. And I looked at her and I said, it's a bag of rocks I gave you a long time ago and Dad's ready to take it back. So why don't you give it back to me? And I hugged her and I told her I was sorry. And she said, it's okay. I said, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. And she said, it's okay. And I said, Janie, don't try to help me right now. This isn't about me. This is about you. I'm just a man. And that's what I believe in for my children. How much more is God looking at you saying, that bag of rocks, self-inflicted, 
someone else gave you, whatever it is, I'll take that now. It is our job to give it to him. He won't pry it out of your hand, but his hand is always open because he loves you so much and because the future is better than the past and it's so much brighter and there's so much more hope. Would you bow your heads, please? If you're in the room and you're moved, can I say if you're moved, it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God moving on your heart. The Spirit of God is moving you so that you will see how much He loves you. And if you're in the room and you say, I'm carrying something and I haven't taken it to God, my relationship with God is not there. My relationship with God is distant. I believe, maybe, I believe in Him. I believe He's there. If I didn't believe He was there, I probably wouldn't be here. Or maybe you're in the room and you say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to believe. But you know that you need to take a step in a relationship. You know you need to take a step towards this Heavenly Father who loves you so much your heart is moved. If that's you, if you're in the room, you say, I, I'm ready to do that. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand on the count of three. Just lift it up and you can put it right back down. One, two, three. Any hands in the room at all? Any hands? I see your hand. Thank you. You can put it down. I see your hand. Thank you. You can put it down, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any hands at all? I see your hand, sir. Thank you so much. We're going to pray a prayer. And really, we're going to pray a prayer, but what that means is we're just going to talk to God. I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to ask you to repeat this after me. It's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of acknowledgement that he is who he says he is, and you are not him but it's a prayer of hope and faith. Would you all repeat this prayer after me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for seeing me, for loving me as I sit. You love me so much you sent your son to die on a cross for my sin. You resurrected him as you are resurrecting me. You paid for new life. So I let go of the old life. And I grab hold of what you have. I don't know how to do it all, but I have faith that you're leading me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. I believe, I'm hopeful you're with me. Thank you for seeing me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all these people. I thank you for the people who raised their hands. Lord, I thank you for the people who wanted to but didn't. You do not condemn them. We are flesh and bone. We are weak. But Lord, we surrender our weakness and accept your strength. And we ask, I ask, on behalf of the people who say, I need to do something. I need relationship. I pray that you show up as you always do, in a way that shows them how much you care for them. That this is not a detached faith, this is a personal faith. And you are personal because you see it all and you love us. Thank you, Jesus, for making it personal, for leaving heaven and coming to earth to be with sinful man, to show the way, to be the bridge, to be our savior, to be our king. We acknowledge it. We accept it. We are not on the throne of our own lives. You are. And we make the transition. And we thank you for leading the way. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Hey, I told you that was going to be great, and I did not lie. Listen, if, if you felt that tug in your heart that today's the day you need to begin your journey walking with the real Jesus. Maybe you prayed that prayer. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time in a long time. It's time for you to get going. Listen, I want you to take out your phone and send to the number 23101, the word Glenpool. A little menu will come up there and it'll say, I raised my hand. Follow the prompts there. Just send us enough information so that we can reach out to you 
and we'll provide you with some resources and some contact. We'll see if we can help make that process rich and valuable to you. Thanks for coming. We look forward to seeing you next time.